Welcome to Celtic Tomes, bringing you readings from bygone books. Welcome to Celtic Tomes, readings by Gary and Ruth from the classic books of Celtic lore and study. Book 2, Chapter 4 of British Goblins, Welsh Folklore, Fairy Mythology, Legends and Traditions by Wirt Sykes. Book 2, Chapter 4, Grotesque Ghosts, including the Phantom Horseman, Gigantic Spirits, the Black Ghost of Fanon Ur Asprid, Black Men in the Mabinogion, Whirling Ghosts, Antic Spirits, the Tridoch Valley Ghost, Resemblance to Modern Spiritualistic Performances, and Household Fairies. Section 1 The grotesque ghosts of Welsh folklore are often most diverting acquaintances. They are ghosts on horseback, or with coloured faces, or of huge and monstrous form. Or they indulge in strange gymnastics, in whirling, throwing stones, or whistling. A phantom horseman, encountered by the Reverend John Jones of Holywell in Flintshire, as described by himself, is worthy of Heinrich Stjocker. This Mr Jones was a preacher of extraordinary power, renowned and respected throughout Wales, he was one day travelling alone on horseback from Bala in Merionethshire to Machanseth, Montgomeryshire, and as he approached a forest which lay in his way, he was dogged by a murderous-looking man carrying a sharp sickle. The minister felt sure this man meditated an attack on his life, from his conduct in running crouched along behind hedges, and from his having met the man at the village inn of San Yuxlin, where the minister exposed his watch and purse. Presently he saw the man conceal himself at a place where the hedge was thick, and where a gate crossed the road, and feeling sure that here he should be attacked, he stopped his horse to reflect on the situation. No house was in sight, and the road was hidden by high hedges on either side. Should he turn back? In despair, rather than in the spirit of humble trust and confidence, says the good man, I bowed my head and offered up a silent prayer. At this juncture, my horse, growing impatient at the delay, started off. I, I clutched the reins which I had let fall on his neck, and when, happening to turn my eyes, I, I saw to my utter astonishment that I was no longer alone, and there by my side I beheld a horseman in a dark dress mounted on a white steed. In intense amazement I gazed upon him. Where could he have come from? He appeared as suddenly as if he had sprung from the earth. He must have been riding behind me and, and, and have overtaken me, and, and yet I had not heard the slightest sound. It was mysterious, inexplicable, but joy overcame my feelings of wonder and I began at once to address my companion. I asked him if he had seen anyone, and then described to him what had taken place, and how relieved I felt by his sudden appearance. But he made no reply, and on looking at his face, he seemed paying but slight attention to my words, but continued intently gazing in the direction of the gate, now about a quarter of a mile ahead. I followed his gaze, and saw the reaper emerge from his concealment and run across a field to our left, resheathing his sickle as he hurried along. He had evidently seen that I was no longer alone and had relinquished his intended attempt. Seeking to converse with the mysterious horseman, the minister found that the phantom was speechless. In vain he addressed it in both Welsh and English. Not a word did it utter, save that once the minister thought it said, Amen, to a pious remark. Suddenly, it was gone. Uh, the mysterious horseman was gone. He was not to be seen. He had disappeared as mysteriously as he had come. What could have become of him? 
He could not have gone through the gate, nor made his horse leap the high hedges, which on both sides shut in the road. Where was he? Had I been dreaming? Was it an apparition, a spectre, which had been riding by my side for at least ten minutes? Was it but a creature of my imagination? I, I tried hard to convince myself that this was the case, but why had the reaper resheathed his murderous-looking sickle and fled? And then a feeling of profound awe began to creep over my soul. I remembered the singular way of his first appearance, his long silence, and the single word to which he had given utterance, after I had mentioned the name of the Lord, the single occasion on which I had done so. What could I then believe but that, in the mysterious horseman, I had had special interference of providence, by which I was delivered from a position of extreme danger? Section 2 of gigantic ghosts there are many examples, which are very grotesque indeed. Such was the apparition which met Edward Frank, a young man who lived in the parish of Lantarnum. As he was coming home one night, he heard something walking towards him, but at first he could see nothing. Suddenly his way was barred by a tall, dismal object which stood in the path before him. It was the ghost of a marvellous thin man, whose head was so high above the observer's line of vision that he nearly fell over backward in his efforts to gaze at it. His knees knocked together, and his heart sank. With great difficulty he gasped forth, In the name of God, what is here? I turn out of my way, or I will strike thee. And the giant ghost then disappeared, and the frightened Edward, seeing a cow not far off, went towards her to lean on her which the cow stood still and permitted him to do. The naivety of this conclusion is convincing. Equally prodigious was the spectre seen by Thomas Miles Harry of the parish of Aberystwyth. He was coming home by night from Abergavenny when his horse took fright at something which it saw, but which its master could not see. Very much terrified, the latter hastened to guide the animal into an adjoining yard and dismount and whereupon he saw the apparition of a gigantic woman. She was so prodigiously tall, according to the account of the horrified Harry, that she was fully half as high as the tall beech trees on the other side of the road, and he hastened to hide from his eyes the awful sight by running into the house, where they listened open-mouthed to his tale. Concerning this, Mr. Harry, we are assured that he was of an affable disposition, innocent, and harmless, and the grandfather of that eminent and famous preacher of the gospel, Thomas Lewis, of Llanhalan in Glamorganshire. The same narrator relates that Anne, the daughter of Herbert Jenkins, of the parish of Dravethin, a young woman, well disposed to what is good, was going one evening to milk the cows by Rhyw Newith, and as she passed through a wood, she saw a horrible black man, "'standing by a holly tree. "'She had with her a dog, which saw it also, "'and ran towards it to bark at it, "'upon which it stretched out a long black tongue, "'and the dog ran affrighted back to the young woman, "'crawling and cringing about her feet for fear. "'She was in great terror at all this, "'but had the courage still to go on after the cows, "'which had strayed into another field.' She drove them back to their own field, and in passing the holly tree, avoided looking that way for fear of seeing the black man again. However, after she had got safely by, she looked back, and saw the monster once more, very big in the middle, and narrow at both ends. And as it walked away, the ground seemed to tremble under its heavy tread. It went towards a spring in that field called Fanon Rasprid, the fountain of the spirit, where ghosts had been seen before, and crossing over the stile into the common way, it whistled so loud and strong that the narrow valley echoed and re-echoed with a prodigious sound. And then it vanished, much to the young woman's relief. Section 3 that giants should appear in the Welsh spirit land will surprise no one, but the apparition of black men is more unique. 
The Mabinogian, however, are full of black men, usually giants, always terrible to encounter. The black man whom Peredir slew had but one eye, having lost the other in fighting with the black serpent of the Khan. There is a mound which is called the Mound of Mourning, and on the mound there is a Khan, and in the Khan there is a serpent, and on the tail of the serpent there is a stone, and the virtues of the stone are such that whosoever should hold it in one hand, and the other he will have as much gold as he may desire. And in fighting with this serpent was it that I lost my eye. From the Mabinogian In the Lady of the Fountain Mabinogi, the same character appears. A black man, not smaller in size than two of the men of this world, and with one eye in the middle of his forehead. And there are other black men in other Mabinogian indicating the extremely ancient lineage of the spectre seen by Anne Jenkins at the Fountain of the Spirit. Whatever Anglo-Saxon scoffers may say of Welsh pedigrees of mere flesh and blood, the antiquity of its spectral hordes may not be disputed. The black giant of Sinbad the Sailor and the monster Woodward of Kinan alike descend from the Polyphemus blinded by Odysseus. Section 4 Another grotesque Welsh goblin goes whirling through the world. Three examples are given by the Prophet Jones. First, Lewis Thomas, the father of the Reverend Thomas Lewis, was on his return from a journey, and in passing through a field near Bedwesty saw this dreadful apparition. To it, the spectre of a man walking or whirling along on its hands and feet, at sight of which... Lewis Thomas felt his hair to move on his head. His heart panted and beat violently. His body trembled, and he felt not his clothes about him. Second, John Jenkins, a poor man who lived near Abedishlery, hanged himself in a hayloft. His sister soon after came upon his dead body there hanging, and screamed loudly. Jeremiah James, who lived in the Abatechlery house, hearing the scream, looked in that direction and saw the resemblance of a man coming from the hayloft and violently turning upwards and downwards, topsy-turvy, towards the river, which was a dreadful sight to a seriously godly man. Third, Thomas Andrew, living at a place called The Farm in the parish of Lanhithel, coming home late at night, saw a whirling goblin on all fours by the side of a wall, which fell to scraping the ground and wagging its head, looking aside one way and the other, making at the same time a horrible mowing noise, at which Thomas Andrew was terribly frightened. Section 5 The antics of these and similar inhabitants of the Cambrian spirit world at times outdo the most absurd capers of modern spiritualism. Of the house of a certain farmer in the parish of Llanchechid in Carnarvonshire, there was a great disturbance by a spirit which threw stones into the house and from one room to another, which hit and hurt the people who lived there. The stones were of various sizes, the largest weighing 27 pounds. Most of them were river stones from the stream which runs hard by. Some clergymen came from Banga and read prayers in the house to drive the spirit away. But their faith was not strong enough, and stones were thrown at them, so that they retired from the contest. The family finally had to abandon the house. On the farm of Edward Roberts, in the parish of Llanginshoch in Radnorshire, there was a spirit whose antics was somewhat remarkable. As the servant man was threshing, the threshel was taken out of his hand and thrown upon the hayloft. At first he didn't mind this so much, but when the trick had been repeated three or four times, he became concerned about it and went into the house to tell of it. The master of the house was away, but the wife and the maid servant <laughs> laughed at the man and merrily said that they would go to the barn to protect him. So they went out there and sat, the one to knit and the other to wind yarn. They were not there long before their things were taken from their hands 
and tumbled about the barn. On returning to the house, they perceived the dishes on the shelves moved to and fro, and some were thrown onto the stone floor and broken. But that night there was a terrible clattering among the dishes, and the next morning they could scarcely tread without stepping on the wrecks of crockery which lay about. This pleasant experience was often repeated. Neighbours came to see. People even came from far to satisfy their curiosity, some from so far as Knighton, and one who came from Knighton to read prayers for the exercising of the spirit had the book taken out of his hand and thrown upstairs. Stones were often cast at the people, and once iron was projected from the chimney at them. At last the spirit set the house on fire. Nothing could quench it. The house was burnt down. Nothing but the walls and the two chimneys stood long after to greet the eyes of people who passed to and from night and market. Section 6 A spirit which haunted the house of William Thomas in Tridoch Valley, Glamorganshire, used to hit the maidservant on the side of her head as if it were a cushion when she was coming down the stairs. M one time she brought a, a marmont of water into the house and the water was thrown over her person. Another time there came so great an abundance of pilchards in the sea that the people could scarcely devour them, and the maid asked leave of her master to go and fetch some of them. No, said he, being a very just man, the pilchards are sent for the use of poor people. We do not want them. But the maid was very fond of pilchards, so she went without leave and brought some to the house. After giving a turn about the house, she went to look for her fish and found them thrown out upon the dunghill. <laughs> well, said her master, did not I tell thee not to go? Once a pot of meat was on the fire, and when they took it off they found both meat and broth gone, and none knew where, and the pot was as empty as their own bellies. Sometimes the clasped Bible would be thrown whisking by their heads, and... So it would do with the gads of the Stella, and once it struck one of them against the screen where a person then sat, and, and the mark of it still to be seen in the hard board. And once the china dishes were thrown off the shelf, and not one broke. Oh, it was a great business with this light-hating spirit to, to throw an old lantern about the house without breaking it. When the maid went to milking to the barn, the barn door would be suddenly shut upon her as she was milking the cow. And then when she rose up, the spirit began to turn the door backwards and forwards with an idle ringing noise. And once it tried to make trouble between the mistress and the maid by strewing charcoal ashes on the milk. When William Evans, a neighbour, went there to pray, as he knelt by the bedside, it struck the bed such a bang with a trencher that it made a report like a gun so that both the bed and the room shook perceptibly. On another occasion, it made a sudden loud noise, which made the master think his house was falling down, and he was prodigiously terrified. It never after that made so loud a noise. The Reverend R. Tibbet, a dissenting minister from Montgomeryshire, was one night sleeping in the house with another person in the bed with him and they had a tussle with the Tridoch spirit for possession of the bedclothes. By praying and pulling with equal energy, the parson beat the spirit and kept the bedclothes. But the spirit, apparently angered by this failure, struck the bed with the cowman, a vessel to hold grain, such a blow that the bed was knocked out of its place. Then they lit a light, and the spirit left them alone. It was a favourite diversion with his goblin to hover about William Thomas when he was shaving, and occasionally cuff him on the side of the head, the consequence being that the persecuted farmer shaved himself by fits and starts in a very unsatisfactory manner and in a most uncomfortable state of mind. For about two years it troubled the whole of that family, during which period it had intervals of quiet lasting for a fortnight or three weeks and once it endeavoured to hinder them from going to church, by hiding the bunch of keys on the Lord's Day, so that for all their searching they could not find them. The good man of the house bade them not to yield to the devil, and as they were loath to appear in their old clothes at the meeting, they were about to break the locks, but first concluded to kneel in prayer, and so did. 
After their prayers, they found the keys where they used to be, but where they could not find them before. One night, the spirit divided the books among the members of the family after they'd gone to bed. To the man of the house, it gave the Bible. To the woman of the house, Alan's sure guide. And upon the bed of the maidservant, whom it was specially fond of plaguing, it piled a lot of English books, which language she did not understand. The maid was heartily afraid of the spirit and used to fall on her knees and go to praying with chattering teeth at all hours of the day or night. And prayer, this spirit could not abide. When the maid would go about in the night with a candle, the light thereof would diminish, grow feeble, as if in dampness, and finally go out. The result was the maid was generally excused from making journeys into the cellar or the garret after dark, very much to her satisfaction. Particularly did this frisky Tredoch spirit trouble the maidservant after she had gone to bed, in winter hauling the bedclothes off her, in summer piling more on her, now, there was a young man, a first cousin to William Thomas, who could not be got to believe that there was a spirit at his kinsman's house, and said the family were only making tricks with one another. Very strong he was, a hero of an unbeliever, like many of his brethren in infidelity. One night, William Thomas and his wife went to a neighbour's wake, and left the house in charge of the doubting cousin, who searched the place all over and then went to bed there, and no spirit came to disturb him. This made him stronger than ever in his unbelief. But soon after he slept there again, when they were all there, and before going to bed he said aloud to the maid, If anything comes to disturb the alley, call upon me as I lie in the next room to you. And during the night the maid cried out that the spirit was pulling the clothes off her bed, and the doubting cousin awoke jumped out of bed and ran to catch the person he believed to be playing tricks with the maid. But there was no creature visible, although there rained upon his doubting head a series of cuffs and about his person a fusillade of kicks, which thrust the unbelief quite out of him, so that he doubted no more. The departure of this spirit came about thus. William Thomas, being in bed with his wife, heard a voice calling him, he awakened his wife, and rising on his elbow, said to the invisible spirit, In the name of God, what seekest thou in my house? Hast thou anything to say to me? And the spirit answered, I have, and desired him to remove certain things out of a place where they had been mislaid. Satan, answered William Thomas in a candid manner, I'll do nothing thou biddest me. I command thee in the name of God to depart from my house. And it obeyed. Section 7 This long and circumstantial account, which I have gathered from different sources, but mainly from the two books of the Prophet Jones, will impress the general reader with its resemblance in many respects to modern newspaper ghost stories. The throwing about of dishes, books, keys, etc. Its raps and touches of the person. Its making of loud noises by banging down metal objects. All of these antics are the tricks of contemporaneous spiritualism. But this spectre is of a date when our spiritualism was quite unknown. The same is true of the spirit which threw stones, another modern spiritualistic accomplishment. For the sake of comparison, I give the latest American case which comes under my notice. The scene is Akron, a bustling town in the state of Ohio. The time, October 1878. Mr. and Mrs. Michael Metzler, middle-aged Germans, with their little daughter, ten years of age, and Mrs. Noss, Metzler's mother-in-law, recently moved to a brick house in the suburbs known as Hell's Half Acre. The house is a good substantial building situated in a somewhat open space, and surrounded by a lonesome, deserted air. A few days after they had moved, they were disturbed by sharp rappings all over the house, produced by small stones or pebbles thrown against the window panes. Different members of the family were hit by these stones coming to and going from the house. Other persons were hit by them, the stones varying in size from a pea to a hen's egg, Mrs. Metzler said that when she went after the cow in the evening, she could hear these stones whistling around her head. 
Mr and Mrs Metzler, who are devout Catholics, had Father Brown come to the house to exercise the spirits which were tormenting them. The Reverend Father, in the midst of his exercises, was struck by a stone and so dismayed thereby that he went home in despair. From a newspaper account. The spiritualists will argue from all this that their belief is substantiated, not by any means that it is shaken. The doubter will conclude that there were clever tricksters in humble Welsh communities some time before the American city of Rochester had produced its mediums. The student of comparative folklore, in reading these accounts, will be equally impressed with their resemblance to phenomena noted in many other lands. The conclusion is irresistible that we here encounter but another form of the fairy which goes in Wales by the name of the Bubach. In England it is called the Hobgoblin, and in Denmark the Nis, and in Scotland the Brownie. Also the resemblance is strong in all stories of this class to certain of the German kobolds. In several of these accounts of spirits in Wales appear the leading particulars of the kobold Hinselmann, as condensed by Grimm from Feldman's long narrative. There is also a close correspondence to certain ghost stories found in China. In the story of Wu from the Che Wan Luk appear details much like those in Hinselmann and equally resembling Welsh particulars, either in the stories given above or those which follow. But we are now drawn so near to the division of familiar spirits that we may as well enter it at once. That was Book 2, Chapter 4 of British Goblins, Welsh Folklore, Fairy Mythology, Legends and Traditions by Wirt Sykes. A link to the full text can be found in the show notes at celtictomes.libsyn.com. That's L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com. You can also find all of the names, place names and other non-English words written down for you in the show notes in the order in which they appear in this reading. If you'd like to comment on this chapter, pop over to our show notes and join in or start a conversation. If you've enjoyed this podcast, why not try our sister podcast, The Celtic Myth Pod Show? which brings the stories of ancient Celts to life with narrative and drama, as well as bringing you modern Celtic music, stories and information. Find the Celtic Myth Pod Show in all the places where the best podcasts hang out or on our website at CelticMythPodShow.com. You've been listening to Celtic Tomes, read by Gary and Ruth. Our theme music is Gander in the Pretty Hole by Slauncher and a link to their music can be found in the show notes at celtictomes.libsyn.com. This podcast has been produced by The Celtic Myth Show. Music